Добрый вечер, пане и пановье. Запрашиваем на виртуальном вечечке по посте. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second virtual tour and the final event of the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's Fall 2023 Improving Lives Through Art Series. My name is Joe Kaliva, and I will once again be your virtual tour guide and docent this evening. And I am extra excited for tonight's very special virtual tour because last year we visited the European countries of Italy and France to not only learn about featured artists from those countries, but to explore and learn about the country itself. And tonight we'll be continuing that series as we head back to Europe for a special visit to the country of Poland, where I have had the incredible honor over the past year and a half to spend a lot of time. We'll concentrate primarily on the capital city of Warsaw and feature two artists who are amazing examples of lives improved through art. Visual artist Zdzisław Bekszynski and our very first musical artist to be featured in the ILTA series, composer and pianist Frederick Chopin, for which I will get to perform a couple of pieces for you on the piano. So I hope you're as excited as I am and ready for a great night of art, music, and history. And before we begin, uh, for the last time this fall season, I would like to introduce the very special president and CEO of MSAA, Ms. Gina Murdoch, for a, a few special words to get the night started. Gina. Thank you for joining us for our final tour of the Improving Lives Through Art Fall Series. We are so thrilled to see the incredible excitement and enthusiasm around this program. Our thanks to Joe Kaliva, our docent and tour guide for tonight's tour. Please know that MSAA could not provide programs and services to meet the needs of the MS community without your support. Our thanks to Sandoz, our sponsor for this evening. I'm excited to learn and follow along on this tour. Take it away, Joe. Thank you so much, Gina. And before we get started, uh, I would like to make uh, one very special announcement uh, and let you know to mark your calendars now for the spring 2024 ILTA series. I'm so happy to officially announce that the ILTA series is returning in the spring, just a couple months away. Uh, and our first event will be on February 13th for our first paint along. I am extra thrilled to announce that returning once again to lead the paint alongs in the spring is Hannah Garrison, the very first uh, ILTA paint along artist and instructor and uh, the, uh, the mission honoree from uh, two benefits ago. So uh, you don't wanna miss those paint alongs. And also the spring series will feature another paint along on March 26th and two new virtual tours by yours truly on March 12th and April 9th. Some exciting additions are coming for the spring 2024 series. So stay up to date by going to engage.mymsaa.org slash spring 2024 for more information. And to those of you who have joined or watched these virtual tours in the past, for the sake of time tonight, we will not be doing a trivia game after the presentation. The whole presentation tonight is a little bit over an hour. So again, for the sake of time, uh, I decided not to do the uh, trivia game. However, we will absolutely do some Q&A after the presentation. Uh, I'll be giving all of you the chance to unmute your cameras and microphones uh, if you want to and join in the discussion. But I encourage you to write in the chat any questions you think about during the presentation so you don't forget them later. 
I see the uh, the chat lighting up, so I know it's active right now. Uh, feel free to post comments in the chat throughout the presentation to interact with the other viewers. And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and leave a comment right now and let us know where you're tuning in from, and I will give you a shout out a little bit later. Finally, I'd like to echo Gina's gratitude to our diamond sponsor, Sandoz, for not only making tonight's event possible, but the entire Improving Lives Through Art series as well. Thank you to Sandoz for your ongoing support of MSAA. All right, without any further delay, let's begin our final tour for the Fall 2023 ILTA series. I learned recently that right here in my home city of Philadelphia, right down the street from our city hall on the Ben Franklin Partway, we have a connection to Poland. This tall statue of a man named Tadeusz Kuzutsko, a national hero and military leader in Poland who came to America in 1776 to help the United States win the American Revolution. He spent a lot of time in Philadelphia before returning to Poland in 1784. Across the street from Kuzutsko is a monument to another historic Polish man, Nicholas Copernicus, or Nikolai Kopernik in Polish, the famous astronomer who formulated the heliocentric model of the universe that placed the sun, not the earth, at its center. Both of these monuments are right down the street from my favorite place in Philadelphia, the Barnes Foundation, where I get to work as a docent. So I thought this would be the perfect place to start our journey tonight. We'll lift off from the Barnes in our virtual rocket ship and head across the Atlantic Ocean to Poland, a trip which normally takes about nine hours or so by plane from the Philadelphia area. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be concentrating mostly tonight on the capital city of Warsaw, which, in my opinion, is the perfect city to talk about lives improved through art. Perhaps no other city in Poland more perfectly embodies the country's long, complicated history than Warsaw, a history that time and time again alternates between periods of suffering and healing, oppression and resilience, tragedy and triumph. President Ronald Reagan once said of this great country, Poland is at the center of European civilization. It has contributed mightily to that civilization. It is doing so today by being magnificently unreconciled to oppression. The American novelist and short story writer Cynthia Ozick once said about the city of Warsaw, cultivation, old civilization, beauty, history, whoever speaks of Paris has never seen Warsaw. Whoever yearns for an aristocratic sensibility, let him switch on the great light of Warsaw. And just as there is a monument in Philadelphia to a Polish general, here in Warsaw, there is a monument to a very famous American general, George Washington, or Jerzy Washington, who was a descendant of Polish ancestors. His lineage traces all the way back to Mieszko I, the first ruler of Poland and the founder of the first independent Polish state. To look around this beautiful, historic, vibrant city, it's almost impossible to believe that only 79 years ago, it had been almost completely annihilated. In response to a military operation called the Warsaw Uprising, in which an underground resistance group of brave soldiers and civilians, grossly outnumbered, launched an attack on the Nazi army, the Nazis retaliated by completely destroying the city. Looking at these images, it's difficult to fathom how anyone could even imagine rebuilding or recovering from so much devastation. 
but we're not talking about just anyone. We're talking about the sons and daughters of Poland. Almost as soon as the war had ended, determined to return their city to the way it was before the Nazi occupation, the citizens of Warsaw began to rebuild. But without much photo or video documentation of what the city looked like before the war, the people of Warsaw needed help. And they got it from a very unlikely source. An 18th century Italian landscape painter named Bernardo Bellotto. The types of landscapes Bellotto painted are known as veduta paintings, highly detailed, large-scale paintings of cityscapes and landscapes. Veduta painters are usually referred to as vedutisti. Bellotto was the nephew of an even more famous vedutista named Giovanni Antonio Canal, more commonly known as Canaletto. At the Barnes Foundation, we have a beautiful veduta painting by Canaletto of the Canareggio Canal in Venice, Italy. The most remarkable thing about veduta paintings is the incredible attention to detail. Every line, crack, shadow, or ripple is executed with absolute precision and accuracy. One of the ways Canaletto captured this photographic detail is through the use of the camera obscura. A darkened room with a small hole or lens on one side through which an image, uh, image excuse me, can be projected onto a wall or table. Canaletto could then trace the projected image to produce a highly accurate representation. Bernardo Bellotto also used the camera obscura technique to produce his highly detailed paintings, but that wasn't the only thing he borrowed from his uncle Canaletto. Canaletto was so famous, Bellotto would often use his uncle's name to increase his own notoriety, signing some of his paintings as Bernardo Bellotto, also known as Canaletto. But Bellotto traveled to Warsaw in 1768 to paint a series of vedute for the King of Poland at the time, Stanislav August Poniatowski. While in Warsaw, Bellotto produced about 26 panoramic views of the city, most of which can be viewed here at the Royal Castle in Warsaw. The king dedicated a special room in the castle to showcase Bellotto's paintings. The room also served as an antechamber where senators could enjoy all the views of the city while waiting for an audience with the king. It has been commonly referred to as the Canaletto Room since the 1780s. But these paintings would later prove to be a vital part of Warsaw's reconstruction after World War II. Those leading the reconstruction of Warsaw used the Bellotto paintings as guides, like this detailed representation of the Newtown Market Square in Warsaw, with the beautiful St. Casimir's Church in the foreground, which had been tragically destroyed during the war. But using the Bellotto paintings, along with the expertise of Polish architects, art historians and conservators, the people of Warsaw began to rebuild their city, brick by brick and piece by piece, until historic treasures like this church were miraculously brought back to life. When you walk through Old Town today, you can see reproductions of Bellotto's paintings on boards or markers like this one, placed throughout the area, explaining their crucial role in the rebuilding process. Like on this street called Krakowskia Przedmieścia, with a view looking toward the Royal Castle. Or this marker 
located in front of the once destroyed Visitationist Church, also located on Krakowski Przedmieszczia Street. This marker is located on Novi Sviat, or New World Street, in front of the famous Holy Cross Church, which we will be revisiting again a little later. These markers are beautiful testaments to the power of art to inspire, to help rebuild, and to improve lives. And sadly, we have seen in recent weeks and months Images of destruction and devastation similar to that which Warsaw endured happening elsewhere in the world right now. We can't adequately address those heartbreaking issues tonight, but it's my hope that these images and Warsaw's strength and resilience can serve as beacons of hope to those suffering from war right now and that it inspires these nations to protect their cultural and artistic past because someday it just might be the means through which they rebuild their future. Our first featured artist tonight is the very first Polish artist to whom I was ever introduced, Zdzisław Begzinski, an abstract surrealism artist who I also discovered had quite a moving story of using art as a coping mechanism for illness and as a means to wellness and improving his life. The first painting by him that I was ever shown was this one an untitled painting that is often referred to by the year in which it was painted, 1984. I was immediately moved and haunted by this image, which struck me first as dark and sad. Two skeletal, decaying figures against a fiery, dystopian background. But as I looked at it longer, I started to see something quite beautiful in this piece. The embrace between the two figures is desperate and urgent, but tender as well. The figure whose back is toward us gently cradles the head of the second smaller figure. They are clinging to each other in the face of something frightening, trying to find beauty among decay and loss. I immediately had to find out more about this artist. And he soon became not only my favorite Polish artist, but one of the most inspiring artists I have ever come to know. Zdzisław Begzinski was born in 1929 in a town located in the southeast corner of Poland called Sanuk, about 130 miles from Krakow. Not much is known about his childhood, but it is known that his interest in art started at a very early age. By the time he was in primary school, he was already drawing. He would spend a lot of time alone with his art, but would often trade his drawings with classmates in exchange for treats or crime novels. But it was in 1939, at the age of only 10, that the young Zdzisław witnessed one of the darkest periods in Poland's history. In September of that year, Hitler's Nazi army invaded Poland, setting the stage for World War II. Bigzinski would spend most of his formative years in a war-torn nation occupied not only by Nazi Germany, but the Soviet Union as well. Before the invasion, the population in the town of Sanek was about 30% Jewish, nearly all of whom were eliminated by the end of the war. Even non-Jewish Polish people were persecuted by the Germans, and this only grew worse by the increasing Soviet presence. Approximately 5.6 million Poles died as a result of the German occupation 
with about 150,000 more deaths due to the Soviets. Begzinski didn't write or speak much about how the war impacted him as a young child, but it's reasonable to assume that living in Poland during such a dark time would have been brutal for anyone to endure, but even more so for a child. But a few years after the war had ended, at the age of 18, Begzinski went to Krakow, Poland to study architecture at the Krakow Institute of Technology and graduated in 1952. He returned to Sanek and found work in the architectural field rather quickly, but it would be another artistic medium through which he would find his true artistic voice. In the mid-1950s, Begzinski discovered a love for photography. He first experimented with montage or collage photography, such as in this self-portrait from 1956 or 57. Some of his work seemed to evoke feelings of isolation or loneliness, or perhaps the monotonous melancholy life in a small town. He then moved towards more abstract portraits and compositions, most often using his wife, Zofia, as his model. Photography was never a means to document something real for Bigzinski. It provided an opportunity to explore the surreal, to create unconventional images that awakened specific emotions rather than only capture the likeness of a model or subject. The sometimes dark or disturbing nature of his photographs seems to challenge the viewer's concept of beauty and even pushes us to redefine it or see beauty where we never thought to look for it before. Photography led Bigzinski to become interested in other types of visual art. And in 1959, he left photography behind to explore these other mediums, like drawing, painting, and sculpture. Similar to his photography, the themes of his early drawings and sculptures seem to focus on the alienated, dark abstract fig figures that seem to evoke feelings of pain or suffering. But he also seemed to apply his architectural training in some of his work with a more geometric or symmetrical structure, particularly in his sculptures. This combination of architectural symmetry, photographic realism, abstraction, and surrealism helped Bigzinski find and create a unique artistic voice and creative vision. But there is no denying the dark and disturbing nature of Bigzinski's work. By all accounts, he enjoyed notoriety and commercial success as an artist in the mid-1960s. And in 1951, he married the love of his life and soulmate, Zofia Stankiewicz. In 1957, Zofia gave birth to their only child, a son they named Tomasz. By all appearances, Bigzinski led a happy and fulfilling life. So why is there so much darkness in his artwork? Surely, Bigzinski was still haunted by the images and memories of war that he witnessed as a child. It's a theme he returned to time and time again throughout his career. But throughout most of his adult life, through all his professional and personal achievements, Bigzinski was living with a debilitating illness, obsessive compulsive disorder, a mental health condition characterized by recurring intrusive thoughts or obsessions and repetitive behaviors or compulsions meant to alleviate the stress caused by those thoughts. It often leads to severe anxiety or distress and in Begzinski's case, his obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, was so severe 
he could barely leave his home. He would often refuse to go to his own exhibits or showcases and couldn't travel or take unannounced visitors because any disruption in his routine or change in his environment would trigger a severe physical reaction, usually in the form of acute gastrointestinal problems. He once said, my life is dominated by a neurotic intestinal disorder and that's it. Hence my reluctance to travel. Everything that separates me from the base, which is a house or an apartment that I own, exposes me to a specific conditioned nervous tension. Begzinski and Zofia also lived with and cared for both of their mothers. The woman seen here between Zofia and Tomasz is Begzinski's mother, Stanisława. Both elder women grew very ill in their later years. Zofia handled most of their care, but without the emotional support or resources that are available to care partners today, watching the women suffer and slowly decay or become worse and worse took a further toll on Begzinski's emotional state. But perhaps most troubling of all, Bigzinski and Zofia's son, Tomasz, also showed early signs of struggles with depression and mental health, conditions which only grew worse as the young man became an adult. But despite all these challenges, Bigzinski found an escape and comfort through his art. And in the 1960s and 70s, he enjoyed national and international recognition as one of the premier contemporary surrealist artists at that time. Bigzinski owed most of his international success, success in part to this man and woman, Piotr, or Peter, Dmachowski, and his wife, Anna. Dmachowski was a lawyer from Paris who was deeply moved after seeing Bigzinski's art during a stay in Poland in 1976. After an arranged meeting with Bigzinski, Dmachowski bought five of Bigzinski's paintings and later became his exclusive art dealer a few years later. He organized exhibitions of Bigzinski's work in France, Belgium, Germany, and Japan making Bigzinski one of an elite handful of Polish artists to enjoy such international recognition. In 1977, Bigzinski and his family, along with both his mother and Zofia's mother, moved 395 kilometers or 245 miles north to Warsaw. This was due in part to yet another distressing event for Bigzinski when the communist government authorities in Sanek decided to demolish the Bigzinski family home where he had lived most of his life to make way for other building projects. But this move was the impetus for the period of Bigzinski's career for which he will forever be most well known. Bigzinski referred to it as his fantastic period, but this style of painting is more commonly referred to as fantastic realism, a term which originated in Vienna in the late 1950s. It combines the painterly precision of the old Renaissance and Baroque masters with an interest in more modern art movements and psychoanalysis. Many of his works during this period were expressions of his ongoing struggle with OCD. For example, one of his most paralyzing obsessions was the thought of someone stuffing spiders into his mouth, a fear that is vividly portrayed here. According to a Polish journalist named Karina Jaska, Bigzinski once said, I wish to paint in such a manner as if I were photographing dreams. 
His work is most often described as portraying a post-apocalyptic or dystopian future, which is what I thought when I first saw his work, but now I couldn't disagree more. The fantastical elements are not there simply for love of the macabre or to frighten people. They are representations of one man's deepest fears and obsessions, his inner demons that he is desperately trying to expel. The destruction and devastation in many of his paintings aren't imagined events. They are scenes he witnessed with his own eyes. Images burned into his memory from the time he was a child, watching his beloved country invaded and torn apart, and seeing so many of his fellow Poles pay the ultimate price. The most comprehensive collection of Bigzinski's paintings from this period is located at the Historical Museum of Sanok, Bigzinski's hometown. Sadly, I didn't have a chance to travel to Sanok to take you on a virtual tour of their galleries. However, I did travel to Krakow to see the second most famous collection of his work, and it was truly a moving experience. It's located in the district of Krakow known as Nova Huta, which translates to the new steel mill, where you can visit the Nova Huta Cultural Center. This beautiful center has been open since 1983 and hosts classes, concerts, and various art exhibits. The Bigzinski Gallery has been here since 2016 and is now part of their permanent collection. It contains 50 paintings that were all given to the center by Bigzinski's friend and representative, Piotr Domachowski, and his wife, Anna. Nobody who walks through these galleries leaves unaffected. Bigzinski's work evokes extreme emotional reactions from his viewers. They leave fascinated or terrified inspired or repulsed. Throughout his career, Bigzinski adamantly argued against assigning meanings to his work or offering interpretations. For this reason, he never titled any of his work. However, as you walk through these galleries, you'll find common, obviously recurring themes, like his representation of military-like figures, all of which exhibit helmets, uniforms, and other characteristics that bear undeniably striking close resemblances to Nazi or Soviet soldiers. There are also many images containing crosses, or perhaps Christian crucifixes, which could possibly be references to the haunting images Bekzinski saw in his childhood of the countless unmarked graves of Polish soldiers. But as I mentioned earlier, if you look deeper at Begzinski's work, if you look beyond the initial feelings of darkness or decay, you'll often find something lovely and quite beautiful. For example, in this painting, the monstrous looking figure is actually holding the smaller figure in red in a tender, protective way. In another painting nearby, a father figure seems to gently cradle his child, reassuring him, offering hope, despite the destruction and decay surrounding them. This might only be my interpretation or what I personally see in these images, but I think that is what Bigzinski intended. He once said, if my art is about anything, it's about mood and atmosphere. I perceive it very musically, every image. Perhaps others see, see it differently, or maybe their perception of music is different than mine. Bigzinski remained in Warsaw and continued to paint for the rest of his life. 
seen here in his apartment and studio in Warsaw, Bigzinski routinely wore headphones when he painted and always listened to classical music. This was possibly related to his obsessive compulsive disorder, or perhaps it helped him perceive that musicality in his paintings about which he spoke. Throughout most of the 1990s, his artistic interests shifted to new mediums like computers, the internet, digital photography, and photo manipulation. However, the 90s were mostly marked by great suffering and loss for Bigzinski. In September 1998, after living with an aortic aneurysm and other health issues for several years, Bigzinski beloved wife and muse of 47 years, Sophia, died in their home at age 70. Just one year later, on Christmas Eve 1999, after battling depression and mental illness for most of his life, Tomasz Bigzinski died by suicide. He was only 41 years of age. But perhaps most tragically, on February 21st, 2005, Bigzinski was found dead in his apartment in Warsaw with 17 stab wounds to his body. He was killed by the teenage son of his longtime caretaker for refusing to loan him about $100. He was 75 years old. Today, if you visit this large apartment building in Warsaw, about five miles south of the city center, where Bigzinski and his family lived on the third floor in the, bre in the breezeway under his apartment, you'll find a mural featuring three images commemorating the home where Bigzinski lived for the last 28 years of his life. And on the side of the apartment block, another small mural, a very simple monument to such an extraordinary artist. How do you begin to understand or where do you start to try and make sense of a life so riddled with challenges, hardship, and pain? For Bigzinski, the answer was art. Art offered Bigzinski a way to cope with profound grief. It provided a space for him to make sense of the world, to confront his demons, and to navigate the complexities of the human experience. Bigzinski's life and work serve as a testament to the transformative power of art. His battle with obsessive compulsive disorder, life in a war-torn country, and personal loss were all met with a creative force that allowed him to expel his inner turmoil and which offers us a window into the depths of the human psyche. The Mexican film director, Guillermo del Toro, who drew a lot of inspiration from Bixinski for his 2006 film, Pan's Labyrinth, once said, Bigzinski's paintings managed to evoke at once the process of decay and the ongoing struggle for life. They hold within them a secret poetry stained with blood and rust. Many people see beauty in Bigzinski's paintings. Others struggle to find beauty in his dark imagery. But a quote I found just a few weeks ago in a Facebook group of fellow admirers of Bigzinski explains the beauty of Bigzinski's work perfectly. A man named John O'Connell wrote of one of Bigzinski's paintings. I see a picture not of death and decay, but of strength and permanence strength of love and permanence of devotion. 
That is the beauty. Our second featured artist tonight and our first uh, musical artist in the ILTA series is Polish-born pianist and composer Frederick Chopin. And to properly uh, introduce our very first musical artist in the ILTA series, I would like to perform for all of you one of his best known short pieces. It is also the very first Chopin piece I ever learned how to play on the piano. That lovely little piece is Chopin's Prelude Number no. 7 in A Major. From a collection of 24 preludes, he composed between 1835 and 1839, when he was between 25 and 30 years of age. It was also composed during a time when Chopin was battling a terminal illness, and the sorrow of being exiled from his beloved homeland of Poland. In fact, it is written in the style of a mazurka, a Polish folk dance that is very similar to a waltz. Sometimes mazurkas can be slower, like the one I just played for you, or other times they can be much more lively. But Chopin so loved his Polish heritage, he wrote many mazurkas and other types of traditional Polish music to remind him of the country he cherished so much and to stay connected to it through the power of music. Chopin was born in 1810, not far from Warsaw, in a small village called Zelazowa Wola about 46 kilometers or 29 miles from the capital city. If you make the one hour drive from Warsaw, you can still visit his birthplace in this small home that was owned uh, at the time by a woman named Ludwika Skarbek. Skarbek employed Chopin's father, Nicholas, as a teacher for her children and Chopin's mother, Justina, as a housekeeper. The couple lived in this servant's quarters, or annex, and in this tiny room on March 1st, 1810, they gave birth to their second of four children and their only son, who they named Frederick. Young Frederick only spent the first few months of his life in this house. In October of 1810, six months after Chopin's birth, his father moved the family to Warsaw, after accepting a teaching position there. But today, this house serves as a beautiful testament to Chopin's legacy, where you can see or hear live performances of his music almost daily, and where you can stroll the gardens to view the beautiful monuments dedicated to his memory. 
and both the house and the grounds are designed to emulate his music through their beauty, grace, and tranquility. While in Warsaw, Chopin showed interest and talent in music at a very early age. His mother was his first piano teacher, but at the age of only six, he began formal lessons with this man, Wojciech Zivny, a well-respected Polish pianist and composer who lived on this familiar street, Krakowskie Przemieszcze, represented here by none other than Bernardo Bellotto. But by the time Chopin was only 11 years old, Zivny realized his young student had already surpassed him and he could no longer teach him anything. But Zivny had a huge impact on Chopin. And in fact, Chopin's earliest surviving musical manuscript is a piece he wrote at the age of only 11 and which he dedicated to his first formal teacher. Even with this early composition, Chopin shows his love of traditional Polish folk music. The Polonaise is another type of traditional Polish dance. It's a little bit more formal or ceremonial. And to hear a little bit of this earliest known piece by the young Chopin, I thought it would be fitting to hear it played by an eight-year-old pianist by the name of Venla recorded back in 2018. This is a portion of Chopin's 1821 Polonaise in A-flat major. What a talent. Once again, that was Chopin's Polonaise in A-flat major from 1821. You can hear the rest of the performance by going to the YouTube link on your screen. Chopin began gave, giving public performances all around Warsaw at the age of only seven years old and his popularity steadily grew throughout his teens. He's seen here in this early drawing at about the age of 16. Soon he was giving performances to Russian Grand Dukes and Tsars. Among them, Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich and Tsar Alexander I. During this time and since the end of the 18th century, Poland wasn't an independent state or country. It was partitioned three different times into three territories or annexes, one controlled by Germany or Prussia, one by Austria, and one by Russia. By 1815, Warsaw was under the control of Russia. But 
Due to his success in Poland as a pianist and composer, in 1830, at the age of 21, to further his studies, Chopin traveled to the city of music, Vienna, Austria. Vienna was the capital of 19th century classical music, and Chopin intended to return to Poland after studying in Vienna, and then possibly Italy. But just a few weeks after leaving Warsaw and arriving in Vienna, the November Uprising of 1830 broke out. It was an unarmed rebellion in the Russian partitioned area of Poland against the Russian Empire in an attempt by Poles to regain their independence. Chopin tried desperately to return home, but his father knew that he would be made to fight in the rebellion. And since Chopin struggled with poor or fragile health most of his life, his father urged him to stay in Austria. Chopin agreed, but 10 months later, the rebellion was crushed. And due to the political upheaval the uprising caused, Chopin was never again able to return to his beloved homeland. In 1831, due to political unrest in Austria, Chopin decided to move to France and study in Paris. Chopin's father was born in France, so with a very French-sounding last name, Chopin was assumed by many to be a French citizen. But in a biography of Chopin, written by a man named Adam Zamoyski, he writes that Chopin never considered himself to be French, despite his father's French origins. He always saw himself as a Pole. In fact, throughout his time in Paris, Chopin experienced long periods of sadness and depression due to missing his homeland so much. but he continued to write mazurkas and polonaises as a way to stay connected with his Polish heritage. In fact, it was during his time in Paris that Chopin composed a polonaise that has become one of his most admired compositions. His polonaise in A-flat major, Opus 53. It is one of his most difficult and virtuosic compositions and one of the few pieces by Chopin that has an epithet or a nickname, the heroic Polonaise. Chopin was always reluctant to title his pieces, kind of like Bigzinski, uh, or give them descriptive names, but his lover and companion at the time, the famous French novelist and journalist George Sand, first heard the Polonaise around the same time as the start of the French Revolution of 1848. Sand was a staunch supporter of the revolution, and on hearing Chopin's Polonaise in A-flat major, Opus 53, she was so moved, she wrote to Chopin and passionately exclaimed, The inspiration, the force, the vigor, there is no doubt that such a spirit must be present in the French Revolution. From now on, this Polonaise should be a symbol, a heroic symbol. It's not clear if Chopin agreed to Sand's recommendation, but the Polonaise is now known by this popular nickname. To listen to the Polonaise, there is no better choice of performer, in my opinion, then Polish-born pianist Arthur Rubinstein. Rubinstein was also born near Warsaw, uh, in a city about 80 miles or 130 kilometers away, called Woj. And uh, is, he is widely regarded as one of the greatest pianists of all time and one of the greatest Chopin interpreters of all time. Regarding the heroic Polonaise, he once called it the composition which is the closest to my heart. 
Here is a portion of a performance by Arthur Rubinstein of the Heroic Polonaise from 1956. Around the same time that Chopin composed the heroic Polonaise, his health took a serious turn for the worse. He battled poor health from the time he was a child, suffering from various conditions, from digestive issues to severe headaches to respiratory problems. In 1831, when he first arrived in Paris, he started suffering from severe coughing fits often coughing up blood. He would also endure long bouts of severe laryngitis or bronchitis. But through all of these health struggles, Chopin's greatest source of comfort and the thing that helped him most to cope with the pain and the challenges from these illnesses was undoubtedly his music. In 1838, as Chopin's health continued to decline, he and George Sand went to the island of Mallorca in Spain to get away from the damp Paris weather and in hopes that the warmer climate would help Chopin's health improve. It was during this period in Mallorca when Chopin composed his 24 preludes for piano, one of which I played for you to begin this portion of the presentation. These short pieces offered Chopin an emotional outlet for the pain with which he was struggling at the time. In several pieces, you can undeniably hear his longing for Poland. In others, you can sense the fear he felt about his health. And perhaps one of the best examples of this is in what is arguably the most famous of the preludes, his prelude number 15 in D-flat major. It's yet another rare example of a Chopin composition that has a nickname. It's commonly called the Raindrop Prelude. Although it's very safe to assume that Chopin definitely didn't agree to this name. In her autobiography, George Sand shared a story that explains how the piece may have earned its epithet. One evening, when she and her son returned to the home where they were staying with Chopin, during a terrible rainstorm. When they arrived, they were confronted by the composer, who was very distraught. While playing his piano while they were gone, Chopin apparently had a dream, or a hallucination, that Sand describes like this. He saw himself drowned in a lake. Heavy drops of icy water fell in a regular rhythm on his chest. 
and when I made him listen to the sound of the drops of water indeed falling in rhythm on the roof, he denied having heard it. He was even angry that I should interpret this in terms of imitative sounds. What Sand is referring to is the prelude Chopin wrote and played for her that night. She seems to suggest that the music was imitating the sound of raindrops, which is what upset Chopin. He never wanted his music to be interpreted as imitative. But most music critics seem to agree that the prelude number 15 in D-flat does suggest the gentle patter of rain due to a soft repeated note that you hear throughout the composition. I will let all of you be the judge. I would like to perform another piece for all of you right now. One of my favorite compositions by Frederick Chopin, his prelude number 15 in D flat major, the raindrop prelude.
I hope you enjoyed that performance of the Raindrop Prelude. But getting back to Chopin and his time in Spain, the rain in Mallorca during Chopin's stay there was particularly bad. What was meant to be an escape to help improve Chopin's health ended up making it much worse. He was diagnosed with and treated for tuberculosis. But recent studies, released in 2011, have shown that Chopin could have suffered from any number of conditions that were unknown at the time, such as temporal lobe epilepsy, which could explain his hallucinations while in Mallorca, or pericarditis, a severe inflammation around the heart, some studies suggest cystic fibrosis, or heart disease caused by rheumatic fever. Whatever the case, it's heartbreaking to imagine the amount of suffering Chopin endured throughout most of his adult life. Between 1842 and 1849, Chopin's health declined rapidly. By October 1849, he was no longer able to sit up and was so weak that he could only whisper. His sister Ludvika came to help him and stay with him by his bedside. Chopin told Ludvika that after he died, he wanted his heart to be taken back to his beloved city of Warsaw and buried there after his death. On the morning of October 17, 1849, Frederick Chopin died peacefully after slipping into a coma the day before. He was only 39 years old. Honoring his final wishes, Chopin's sister obtained his heart after his autopsy and brought it back to Poland. It is now enshrined here at the Holy Cross Church in Warsaw. Though he was never able to return to his homeland himself, his heart now rests in the city and country that he loved so much. Frederick Chopin is more than just a historical figure in Poland. He is a symbol of national pride. Even in his lifetime, he, he wasn't able to return to the Russian-controlled partition of Poland in which he grew up, because of the Polish nationalism and identity he expressed through his music. Today, you see his image or name everywhere around Warsaw. The airport is named after him. Schools are named after him. Numerous murals are dedicated to him. And his music fills the streets and parks around Warsaw with countless free recitals and concerts. During World War II, the Nazis understood the unifying power of Chopin's legacy and tried to steal and destroy the heart from Holy Cross Church. But the defiant Polish people wouldn't let that happen, and the heart was hidden and protected throughout the war and returned to its final resting place afterward. Another symbol of Poland's resilience is the piece by Chopin that I would like to end with tonight, his Nocturne in C-sharp minor. It was written in 1830, the year Chopin left Warsaw for Vienna, but couldn't return due to the uprising. A little over 100 years later, the very same piece was being performed during a live radio broadcast by this man famous Polish pianist Władysław Spilman. The date of that radio broadcast was September 23rd, 1939, the day Germany sieged Warsaw. In fact, the bombing of the city interrupted Spilman's performance, and he had to stop right in the middle of playing the nocturne. 
Spielmann, a Polish Jew, survived the Holocaust after being confined in the Jewish ghettos and then living in hiding for many years during the war after he escaped from the ghettos with the help of many of his friends. When the war was over in 1945, Spielmann returned to the radio station for the first live broadcast since the Nazi invasion. When the broadcast started, Spielmann sat down at the piano, dusted off the keys, and started playing Chopin's Nocturne in C-sharp minor, picking up right where he left off when the bombing began six years earlier. That is the spirit of the Polish people. And the Nocturne in C-sharp minor is the piece that I would like to leave all of you with tonight.
Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me this evening for this very special virtual trip to Poland and the final virtual tour of the Fall 2023 Improving Lives Through Art series. Uh, I would love to uh, answer any questions if there are any. Uh, um, you're welcome to write them in the chat uh, or uh, unmute your microphones and just uh, jump in uh, to the live session here. Um, I do want to take a moment to uh, once again thank uh, our wonderful sponsor, Sandoz, uh, for making this entire season possible. Uh, the Fall 2000 uh, 2023 Improving Lives Through Art series, as well as uh, the previous uh, seasons. Um, thank you, Sandoz, for your support of uh, MSAA. And I want to give a shout out, a special shout out to um, the uh, ILTA team member who is behind the scenes tonight, her first solo flight <laughs> of uh, an ILTA event, uh, Tori Hepler. Tori, thank you very much for um, your behind the scenes work tonight and uh, for being part of the team. I did uh, get to see uh, some of the uh, 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 people uh, were uh, put in the chat where they were from. Uh, thank you very much, Evelyn, for your for your very kind words. Uh, but uh, want to just give a few shout outs. Uh, one to Anita joining from Glenview, Illinois. Thank you, Anita, for joining. Tracy from Florida. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for joining. Gina from the Jersey Shore, um, uh, and Janet from Chile, Atlanta. Um, I don't know if that's an actual city in Atlanta, uh, near or a suburb of Atlanta, chilly Atlanta. But um, Janet, thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, uh, thank you once again, everybody, especially those of you who uh, joined throughout this season. I, I was looking at the participants, and it does seem like uh, there are a few board members uh, joining us tonight. Um, I don't know exactly everyone who is on the board, but uh, those of you who are MSAA board members, thank you so much for uh, joining this evening. And uh, well, and I know this was a little bit of a later uh, presentation, so thank you for sticking with us uh, uh, throughout uh, the entire uh, event. Uh, I don't see any uh, comments or questions in the chat. I know it's getting a little bit late. Uh, maybe some of you have uh, holiday uh, uh, preparations <laughs> to get back to, uh, so I won't keep you too late here tonight. Uh, thank you to Gina Murdoch, uh, to Jen Gaynor, who is uh, not with us here tonight, but uh, Gina uh, and everybody at MSAA for all the work that you do for this incredible organization. And with that, I will just say happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy the rest of 2023. And I hope to see you back here for our first event in February for the Spring 2024 Improving Lives Through Art series. Thanks again, everyone, and see you in the spring. Have a good night. <laughs>